Hello, I'm Andrew Pearce and this is The Daily Show from The Daily Mail Newsroom. Coming up, there's a 20% increase in complaints about nuisance calls last year. They've now reached 93,000 between January and September, but there are easy ways to stop them getting through, so stay tuned. We'll be talking to the former editor of a vegan magazine who's given up vegan food because she says it made her unhealthy. Greg's has closed its only store in Cornwall after a row with locals about genuine Cornish pastries. I'm talking to the former Labour leadership contender, Owen Smith, on who he says definitely shouldn't be the next Labour leader. And on that story about Meghan, I'm going to be talking to the Daily Mail's columnist, Sarah Vine. So the recriminations continue of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's decision to step away from frontline royal duties. In today's Daily Mail, Sarah Vine points out the finger of blame for the couple's decision is pointed almost exclusively at Meghan. Well, I'm pleased to say Sarah Vine joins me on the line now. Sarah, it's a two-way decision, presumably, but Harry's the prince. Has he been weak? I don't think he's been weak. I think that um, what I would... uh, what I would say is that when things like this tend to happen, everyone blames the woman. It's yeah. like a sort of cliche, isn't it? It's like Lady Macbeth. You know, I remember when, when I when I said something about my husband's career to him, like, oh, I should have an opinion about, you know, what happens to my family in my life. I was painted as Lady Macbeth. And I, so I do have some personal sympathy for her because I know what it feels like <clears throat> to be blamed, um, you know, for, for, for something that a man has done. Um, and, and that's okay. But I think, so, you know, it is a joint decision, and uh, you know, however much she may have been a catalyst for this, I think the difficulties that Harry has been experiencing probably go extend way back before he even met her. If you know what I mean. I mean, yeah. the fact is that you know he's a very damaged man, understandably so, because of what happened with his mother. Um, I think he has um, a very complex relationship with his father, and I think he also probably has quite a complex relationship with the royal family. Because, of course, it was because of her marriage with the royal family that his mother became so unhappy. And I think that he um, feels that he, she wasn't perhaps always treated as she should have been. And all of that resulted in the outcome that we saw. And I think that so he has a lot of complexities. And I think one of the things that, that happens with people who have sort of childhood traumas like that is that when they have their own children, they sort of bubble up. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Um, because having your own child really sort of transforms you and it makes you think about your own childhood and your own parents in a different way, in a very different way. And I think maybe that perhaps the birth of Archie has sort of slightly focused Harry's mind on what his priorities in life are. And, um, you know, there is nothing wrong with a man wanting to make a success of his marriage and wanting to create a safe, happy environment for his children or his child. I think where they have gone wrong is in the manner in which they've done it. I think they've behaved appallingly and stupidly in their children. And basically, uh, you know, there were so many better ways of doing this. I mean, they should have agreed it all first with the Queen. They should have got the power to make a statement. They didn't. They couldn't, they couldn't wait. They were sort of, you know, they were sort of over-enthusiastic about their own decision. Um, so I think there's lots of mistakes being made there. But I think fundamentally this notion that Meghan is, some sort of evil witch who's come in and sort of trans, you know, transfixed Harry and turned him into a sort of basilisk is, is, is unfair. Um, you know, she is what she is. Uh, she's a, you know, valley girl from California, very ambitious, very successful, very pushy, as you have to be in that business. And I think, in the, you know, to a great extent, you know, he, he fell in love with her. I'm sure partly because of those attributes, because he, she is so different from all the sort of you know, groomed uh, Sloanes that have been sort of presented to him on a plate for the last 20 years. Do you know what I mean? He's yeah. a, he's a, and I think part of him might have deliberately chosen uh, a woman who had such, I mean, she does have a very independent spirit. Um, you know, she is uh, ruthless, in fact, with her independent spirit. Uh, uh, you know, she does go to people, she does move on when she doesn't think they're working for her anymore. She's very sort of focused on her own, path through life. Now, you know, you may not like that, but I think for Harry, that sort of strength of character in a woman um, is, is, kind of, is, you know, perhaps something that he really admires. Sarah Vine, Daily Mail columnist, never miss her column every Wednesday. Now, if you enjoy The Daily Show, please subscribe to us and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google or Spotify. And do get in touch by emailing me at dailyshow at mailplus.co.uk or you follow us at mailplus.co.uk 
underscore. The battle for the Labour Party continues. Momentum has been accused of stitching up the Labour leadership contest after balloting its members on whether it should back L- Rebecca Long Bailey, seen as the Corbyn continuity candidate, without offering any of the four alternatives. To the fury of senior figures, or some senior figures inside the pro-Corbyn campaign group, its 40,000 members were on Tuesday asked to vote yes or no on whether they should support the Shadow Business Secretary's candidacy. Labour moderates say it's ridiculous that members hadn't been asked their opinion on the four other candidates pointing out momentum been founded to make Labour more democratic. I think it was founded to keep Jeremy Corbyn in his job. Well, Joining me now is Owen Smith, a former Shadow Northern Ireland Secretary who was Labour leadership candidate in 2016, wasn't it? It was indeed, Andrew. You didn't succeed. Do you think if you had beaten him, Labour would not have gone down to such a crushing defeat in December? Yes, I do think that. Uh, I mean, you can't obviously know, um, but I think it's uncertain that we would have had an election in 2017 even, and I said when I ran against Jeremy Corbyn that I feared that the Labour Party, with that sort of a uh, far-left platform and led by somebody who was clearly not going to be trusted by many people, traditional Labour voting uh, people amongst them in our country, was going to lead us to a crushing defeat. And that's proved, unfortunately, to be accurate. You stood down at Parliament, Owen Smith, but as a long-standing Labour Party member, you were an MP for 10 years, you were in the shadow cabinet. How bad is it for Labour out in the country when we get beyond that Westminster bubble? Uh, You're Welsh, the Tories did very well in Wales. I mean, do you see now that the Labour Party is in a real sense of crisis? Yes, this is absolutely existential. Uh, You know, 200 seats is a devastating position for Labour to be in, especially in a uh, in, a, in, a, in a world in which the prospect of us bouncing back in Scotland seems to be extremely unlikely, meaning we need to you know, win seats that we've never won before in parts of England and Wales in order to have any chance of uh, forming a, a standalone government. I and mean, that seems to me to be such a distant prospect now. And we've done such unbelievable damage to our reputation by the way in which we've been led and by some of the policies we've been put forward and frankly the way in which we've made ourselves a laughing stock in many parts of the country and I've lost the support of people who supported us for generations um, not unthinkingly but thinkingly and now unfortunately thinkingly they've rejected us. Laughing stock is a tough expression to use in what sense do you think in some parts of the country Corbyn reduced your party to a laughing stock? I think people couldn't quite believe that we were sticking with him. Um, and I had uh, hundreds, thousands of conversations with uh, Labour Party supporters who thought that the Labour Party was undergoing some sort of crisis, that we were uh, enthralled to this man and that we were uh, going to go into an election with him when they looked at us incredulously and said, you know, we can't possibly vote for Jeremy Corbyn and for a Labour Party led by him. There's five candidates now running to be leader. Jess Phillips, Keir Starmer, Emily Thornbury, Lisa Nandy, Rebecca Long-Bailey. Have you made your mind up yet, Owen Smith, who you're going to support? Uh, Well, I'm not going to... I think we've got really good candidates this time round in this election. Keir Starmer, Jess Phillips, Lisa Nandy, all plausible people who could uh, put the Labour Party back together and try and get us back within striking distance of, of Downing Street. Uh, One of those candidates who you didn't mention, Rebecca Long-Bailey, you knew I was going to single her out, of course. She, in an interview, uh, was asked what mark out of 10 she would give Jeremy Corbyn. Astonishingly, in my view, she gave him 10 out of 10. You wonder what she might have given him if he'd not led Labour to their worst defeat since 1935. (laughs) If they choose a candidate like Rebecca Long-Bailey, who is, without doubt, seen as the Corbyn continuity candidate, what would be the outcome for Labour at the next general election? Oh, we will be utterly crushed. Um, uh, and, and I think that the prospect of the party actually holding together in the event of Rebecca Long-Bailey being elected and leading us into election is, is frankly, uh, well, open to question. Uh, she, uh, any, any continuity Corbyn candidate who thinks that they can... Uh, just win with one more heave, as the left often, you know, over the over the decades, as uh, as believed, is well, frankly, barking mad. 
Tough words from Owen Smith, former Shadow Northern Ireland Secretary, who was the Labour leadership candidate against Jeremy Corbyn in 2016. Now, just to remind you, get in touch by emailing me at dailyshow at mailplus.co.uk or follow us at mailplus underscore. Now, the journalist and former vegan living magazine editor, Flick Everett, she followed a strict vegan diet for three years until last summer. After some pretty awful medical symptoms, she endured blood tests, endless visits to the GP and was even referred to an oncologist. The cause of her illness turned out to be her vegan diet choices. Joining me now on the line is Flick herself. Flick, tell me about it. It's all to do with your allergy to nickel, which I understand is a key part of the vegan diet. Hi. Yes, that is absolutely right. I had no idea about this. And in fact, I don't think many people know about it. It's quite rare at the moment. But obviously, as more people turn vegan, it might become more common. I'd always had an allergy to uh, nickel jewellery, you know, the sort of cheap jewellery that's coated in nickel, and it always brought me out in a bit of a rash. But I never thought that there was any nickel in food. I didn't have a clue about that. So when I went vegan um, three and a half years ago now, I had no idea what was causing the weird symptoms that I was experiencing and it took two and a half years for me to get a full diagnosis and discover that it was the nickel in the food I was eating that was causing the problem. And I think nickel is in the soy which is a mainstay of of the vegan diet. Yes that's absolutely right it's it's high in soy in nuts in seeds, beans, pulses, all of the things that vegans regularly eat to replace the protein that they would have got from meat or fish. And how many people are you, Flick, are, suffer the same nickel allergy that you have? It, it, you said it's rare. It, 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 how rare is it? I have absolutely no idea, I'm afraid. All I know is that I was referred to a large city hospital. Mine was in Glasgow um, with a lot of specialists, and obviously they know what they're talking about. Um, and the guy I spoke to, my consultant, who I eventually was referred to, said it was extremely rare. Um, he hadn't seen it much before. There were no dietitians who specialized in nickel allergy through food because it's so unheard of. But it's also the case that, relatively speaking, there's been very few vegans um, in Britain. And it may be that people who do suffer from a nickel allergy from jewellery or touching metal or whatever may find that if they switch to a totally vegan diet, of course, they might also suffer some of these symptoms. And the point is, many people are trying veganism this January for health reasons. Uh, um, I think the numbers in Britain now is, is in around 3.5 million people who identify as vegans. If people like you, um, Flick, are suffering from dodgy health conditions, bad stomachs, whatever, what advice would you give them? Well, I think the main advice is to understand what's normal for you. And if you start to experience something that isn't normal soon after switching to a fully vegan diet, it's very much worth looking at the foods you're eating, maybe talking to your GP. I mean, my problem was my GP hadn't even heard of the nickel allergy in foods, so they, they didn't know. It was very hard for me to get a diagnosis. But I think for any kind of allergy or any problem, it's very important not to ignore it, not to assume it can't be your diet. I'm very pro veganism ethically i think it's a great thing and i would have loved to stay vegan but i think you have to put your health first and if you're suffering in any way then in a way that could be triggered by dietary changes you really do have to look into it and don't ignore it all right that's flick everett jonas a former vegan living magazine editor on one of the perils of being a vegan now coming up after the break we meet the cornish pasty shop owner rebellion fighting back rather successfully against Greg's, and we have the definitive guide to stopping those really irritating cold calls. But first, time to find out what's on TV tonight with, you know who, Claudia Connell. Grace and Frankie is back on Netflix. Raise your glasses, people, to the newlyweds, Grace and Nick. Surprise! You're worried things are going to change, but things won't change. Everything is going to change. So you're Nick's new wife? That's me. I'm the new wife, too. Me, too. That my best friend made a huge mistake. It's a new series and it's available from today. And it's a really funny American comedy. Jane Fonda is Grace and Lily Tomlin is Frankie. They're two older women and they form an unlikely friendship after their husbands leave them to go off with each other. In this series, Grace has remarried and, and Frankie is struggling to cope with the change in their routine. 
There's so many amazing household names in the show. Martin Sheen is in it. Sam Waterson is in it. It's definitely worth a watch. Next up, 24 Hours in Police Custody on Channel 4. We believe we found a deceased person in the woods. I'm thinking it feels like an execution. What happened? I did not murder him. You think I did? Then do something to pilot. And he's saying you told him that. He's trying to kill his property. Only the killer would know that. It's the second and concluding part of the Murder in the Woods special edition of this police documentary series. A man was brutally murdered in a Cambridgeshire park, and tonight we see how he died and who was responsible. So it all, all the pieces come together tonight. I mean, this is such a, a terrific series anyway, and this special has been really amazing. Rich Kids Go Homeless on Channel 5. No prizes for guessing what the premise of this show is. Six very privileged youngsters agree to live on the streets to see what it's like to be homeless. I mean, the problem is they're not seeing what it's like, are they? Because they've got a film crew with them and they're safe and they're protected. It's it's cheap and it's just it's just really insulting to the people whose plight they're supposedly highlighting. Thanks, Claudia. Now it's time for our regular city update with Ruth Sunderland, of course, business editor at the Daily Mail. Ruth, Fly B is still dominating the money pages, and I'm not surprised because mm. it appears the government is bailing them out. I'm just puzzled. Why is the government bailing out the billionaire tax exile, Richard Branson? Because don't Virgin <laughs> Atlantic have quite a stake in Fly B? Yeah, they do. So Virgin um, are part of a consortium which took over Fly B um, just around a year ago. Um, so, you know, the first question you might ask is, well, this is rather quick after that for this of all to to gone wrong, to have gone wrong. And, you know, you're quite right. Um, you, you're raising the same question here that Willie Walsh has raised. He's written to the Which Transport... The British to, Airways, to ma'am. The British, the, the, he's, the, he's the chief executive of the company that owns British Airways. Yeah. Um, so he's written um, to Grant Shapps saying, well, you know, why are you doing this? This is a blatant misuse of taxpayers' money. That's that's his words, not mine. And he's pointing out to the fact that um, Flybe has some very wealthy backers. And really, are these the sort of people that taxpayers ought to be bailing out? And the reason the, the Johnson government has stepped in so mm. quickly, uh, very keen on preserving its new, newly found supporters in the north of England, Absolutely. the Midlands. Flybe is very important for regional airports. Well, it is. And and so this, is, this I think, is, is the argument, is that... Um, so Thomas Cook went under, as you know, without um, a government bailout, mm. which they did want. Um, in 2017, Monarch Airline went under and there was no government bailout there. So the argument is that the difference is, is here, it's, this isn't all about people going on holiday, that these flights are a vital lifeline um, from Cornwall, from Northern Ireland, from places like this. And also not just that, but they, they're not just point to point, but they link people into the hubs at Heathrow and beyond. Yeah. So saying that th- these are important for business and for connectivity in the regions. And just briefly, how has the government financial support, how is it going to manifest itself? Is it something to do with the, fl- the flight tax? Yeah, so w- well, it's not so we haven't been privy to all the detail, but what seems to be, um, what we do know at this point is, is that they have been looking very carefully at a concession around airport passenger duty. Mm. Um, now that in turn does beg some questions because it may well be that, that Flybe has already collected this tax from mm. the passengers. So where has that money gone? Have they? Why haven't they passed that straight on? Very it's interesting. A it's going to continue. The controversy will continue. That's Ruth Sunderland, business editor at the Daily Mail. And Deputy Sports Editor Matt Gatwood is here, of course, with the latest things looking up for Newcastle. Yeah, well, absolutely. If you if you were to spend £40 million on a striker, how many goals would you have wanted him to have scored so far this season, given that we're over halfway through the season? I wouldn't spend £40 million on a striker, because I think it's a if, scandalous yes, waste of money. Yes, but if you had spent... Uh, right. How I'd many? expect him to score... 14 goals. Yeah, well, he uh, Joe Linton, who is the right. man in question, got his second goal of the season oh, last night. Uh, <laughs> and gone, the season's halfway over, isn't it? It's more than halfway through. Right. He'd gone 20 games without a goal. Right. Uh, so not a great return. Um, but, you know, to cut him some slack, he's a Brazilian kid. It's his first season mm-hmm. in the top flight. Um, it's uh, the Newcastle number no. 9 shirt is a, is a shirt with a lot of history, uh, including a certain Alan Shearer. So it's a tough it's a tough gig. You know what Newcastle like as a city. They're mad about their football. Mm-hmm. It is a tough 
tough gig. So hopefully his second goal last night in a 4-1 thrashing of Rochdale in the FA Cup Rochdale. might have got. Well, I could beat. I could beat Rochdale. <laughs> you could score what against division Rochdale. Division are they in you? nine? They're in the second. No, yeah. first. Sorry, League oh, One. Okay. So you know, um, you're right. You're right. It's not. Uh, but you know, hopefully this is a goal that sort of re- he scored quite early in the season. Went 20 games without a goal. So maybe this will kickstart his uh, his time again. Steve Bruce is very pleased. The manager is very pleased with him and hopes that this is the start uh, of something good for the uh, for the lad. And Man United playing tonight? Man United play tonight against Wolves at Old Trafford. Uh, is this a cup match? Uh, FA Cup replay. Right. So they will be obviously desperate to uh, to get a win. It's, you know, that and the Europa League is only Ollie's chances of getting a trophy. Now the Wolves boss have been complaining about the price of tickets for the Wolves supporters to go along. 55 quid for a ticket, which is steep. Mm. Um, but I don't suppose they'll mind too much if they knock Man United out of the cup tonight. And Luckless Leach heads home. Where's he heading home from? And what sport is he? <laughs> Luckless Leach. Is, is this rugby or He's cricket? The, now, you remember last year when Ben Stokes' heroics at Headingley, when he smashed all those runs to I win do. England and Test match, yeah. he had a certain player at the other end right. who got one run in that massive partnership okay. that was that was Jack Leach with the right. glasses who right. kept cleaning his glasses well unfortunately he's been sent home from the tour of South Africa so England have now lost their front line spinner he's from this tour because he's ill he's not recovered from this illness right. he's actually quite sad he's got Crohn's disease oh he's been fighting some of these this illness the gastroenteritis has been there oh also told he had sepsis during the um, uh, during the tour of New Zealand yeah so That's pretty serious, serious stuff so he's been sent home to get well and it remains to be seen whether he'll be fit enough to play in Sri Lanka in March uh, in the in the test series that's coming up then so terrible news for him and he's a very popular man around the England camp so it's a bit of a blow for them to lose him well you think they're going to lose it anyway the test. I think they're going to lose the test even yes. more so <laughs> Deputy Sports Editor Matt Gatwood <laughs> so first there was Brexit then Megxit and now traditional pasty fans have even had a Grexit are you keeping up with me they've forced the popular bakery to uh, chain to shut its only branch in Cornwall a year from opening. Locals in Saltash were not pleased when Greg's opened in their county in September last year, branding it junk and Satan's franchise. Satan's franchise? They've chosen to remain loyal to their famous Cornish pasties, or is it pasties? Locals opted to avoid the bakery chain, bucking the trend compared to the rest of the UK where Greg's has seen its profits soaring. Join me now is one of the revolutionaries that led the charge, Fergus Muller, co-owner of Anne's Pasties and the son of Anne. Uh, Fergus, is it pasties or pasties? It's um, definitely pasties. Okay. Without right. a doubt. Now, um, uh, why, why, why the, the, the peasants revolt about um, Greg's? Is it because they don't do genuine Cornish pasties? Well, it's not... I'm from a different area to Saltash altogether, but right. I'm from, like... The Lizard Peninsula area, the most southerly tip. Yeah, great part of Cornwall. Um, oh, it's lovely down here. But we, even in our area, my mum's uh, recipe came to me and we've made the pasty. This is kind of our patch of Cornwall. So if you could imagine a non-Cornish company coming into Cornwall and trying to make pasties, it's not going to go down that well. So how did you see them off? Did you run campaigns or did people simply just not buy the Greg's pasties? We weren't actually to do with it. We've just been phoned up as pasty, uh, I get pasty you. makers, I think. Yeah. Yep. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't chase Greg's out of town because they wouldn't really compete with us anyway on the pasty front. OK. Now tell me what is the... Are you allowed to give away the secret of your mum's pasty recipe? Well, the thing is, it came from my gran. My gran was a um, local in Port Leban. Well, it went to my mum and then I'm making it as well. It's just our family recipe, nicely seasoned and using local ingredients. And we use all of our ingredients from 10 mile radius. Right. So it's just um, a high quality um, pasty, really. And is it, do you just do meat pasties? Do you do cheese pasties, vegetable pasties? We do a cheese pasty for vegetarians and a vegan pasty. You do vegan pasties too, because of course, Greg's got big, big bucks out of their vegan sausage, I think, or their vegan sausage roll. Yeah, we do. Um, we, a few years ago, we realised there was quite a demand for vegan pasties. So, we did, uh, we did do something for them. And um, how much does a pasty cost? Ours, at the medium size, is three eighty five. Right, OK. Now, is your mum still involved yeah. in the business? Well, funny enough, mum's right here with me as oh, well. Oh, is so she? she? to have a chat with I do, I do. I can pass you over. Right, OK, let's speak to the godmother of pasties. <laughs> Hello, Anne. Hello. Hello, Anne. So, um, your Hi. pasties are king of the castle in Cornwall, are they? Well, in this neck of the woods, we're, uh, it's a popular brand. Right. 
Um, did you ever try the Greg's pasties? No. Was that on principle? No, certainly not. Um, there's not a, a Greg's anywhere near us. Oh, um, right. I'm, seven, I'm nearly 80 miles away from the Greg's that has closed in Saltash. Okay. And what, and, what, and what do you think about them being sent packing from the county? Are you rather pleased, really? Well, not necessarily. Um, I I can't believe the the, the media. I oh, you know what the media people... are like. <laughs> no, because I have friends in Saltash. Yeah. Um, one one uh, was once a town councillor. Yeah. And he just sort of said, well, quite, he said, well, he doesn't, he doesn't, he hasn't heard of anyone sort of um, pushing anyone out or being uh, uh, aggressive in any way about um, Greg's coming in and making pasties. Um, uh, uh, he's heard nothing, though. He's not in the, he's not in the circle of, right. of gossip, if you know I what I mean. You. And- um, yeah, and I uh, also, also go on. My, my other friend, my, my 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 other friend who lives there, said, "Oh, it quietly sort of seemed to disappear." Yeah, and um, also uh, Warrens, which is another Cornish um, bakery from down this end, actually, but they ha- they have shops all over um, Cornwall and mm. up into uh, the southwest of England. Um, they've closed recently in Saltash as well, so I don't know what that's all about. Perhaps Salt Saltash. Uh, families make their own pasties maybe that's so now i'm very curious and do is it tourists buy your pasties or locals or both both yeah and, yeah, and, yeah. and what and what time just by now what time are you up in the morning or at night baking your first row of pas- row of pasties is it an early start uh, well, per- yeah well personally myself i i i'm 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 don't bake very many at the lizard the most southerly point i mean my trade is hugely increased um, during the summer months, yeah. Uh, but my, my my son has uh, grown and pasty business, and he's the one that gets up very early in the morning to get his pasties made for um, well mail order uh, functions, right. um, two or three shops, um, uh, two shops of his own that he is um, stocks. And uh, yes, he's the one. I suppose you sh- uh, it's really gone, taken it to a very commercial. Very level. good. Well, listen, I think we're going to have to get we're going to have to get and buy some of them because they sound very good. What time will he be up tomorrow morning, Anne, cooking the first pasties? Three, uh, four o'clock. Um, yes, yeah, the winter will probably be up uh, about six thirty, but in the summer we could be up as early as quarter to five. Oh, you, you're devoted to your cause. And have you had pasty for for your lunch today, Fergus? Funny enough, yes, I did. <laughs> you practice what you preach. <laughs> That's Fergus Muller and Anne, co-owner of Anne's Pasties, a family pasty business. I like pasties. I really thought the word was pasties. If you want to get in touch, email me at dailyshow at mailplus.co.uk. You follow us at mailplus underscore. The high-pressure salesmen are slick, persistent and tricky. Good morning, madam. Good morning. I'm afraid I don't want to. You've been selected for a special introductory offer, madam. Don't be caught. Think, is it worth the money? He may say he can save you pounds per week. So are you sick and tired of being offered double glazing, car insurance, the enlargement of a particular body part or accusations you've been in a a motoring accident? Well, Money Mail might have the answer to silencing those cold calls for good. Amelia Murray's come up with a definitive guide in Money Mail today and I'm pleased to say she's with me in the studio now. So, first of all, Amelia, 92,500 reports of nuisance calls between January and September. That's just the people who've complained. Absolutely. I mean, the problem is growing all the time. Um, and the methods that fraudsters are using now to bypass um, kind of call blocking technology is also kind of getting more sophisticated. Right. So kind of what I was looking at is the free services that a number of broadband um, and telecoms providers are offering customers to block withheld numbers or numbers that they don't trust. Okay. But what fraudsters can do is they can spoof numbers. So it looks like they're calling from your bank. I mean, oh. I don't know about you. How often are you kind of picking up calls to your bank or withheld numbers or unknown numbers? Uh, it's quite often. But you see, if, if if somebody gets through to me, Amelia, and they start whittering, I just say, oh, yes, I'm really interested. I put my phone down on the t- desk and walk away and come Very back wise. in five minutes. See, I had a call from a, a number that appeared on my phone. It wasn't saved. Um, and it was someone purporting to be from HMRC. God. Um, and yeah. it, they were stern and they were official. And this is a kind of a well-known scam that we've also reported on. Yes, you have. Um, and they, you know, they were asked for my details. And there was no reason to believe that they weren't calling from HMRC, yeah. given the kind of authority that they spoke with. Yeah. Um, but I kind of, you know, I knew about it. So I hung up after asking some questions. Because, because that's because of the work you do. What are the solutions that you've identified today, Amelia? 
So speak to your um, telecoms provider. They all have uh, similar services, but they, they vary slightly. So, for example, um, BT and Plusnet have a service called Call Protect, which mm-hmm. is free to landline customers, um, which involves you dialing 1572 to block um, numbers that you, you no longer kind of want to receive. Yeah. Um, Talk Talk has something called Call Safe, and Sky has Talk Shield. So these are sort of some of the, mm. the bigger providers. Um, you can usually manage it through your online account, or you can kind of call customer services. But if you don't have an online account, Call customer services. Right. Um, you should have that uh, have that number yeah. um, in sort of like your documents. There's also the telephone preference service, right. which basically um, it makes sure that you are off the list of unsolicited marketing calls. However, the calls can still get through because a number of these companies are dodgy and they don't really care about the rules. So they will be breaking the rules, but they're kind of probably based and, somewhere else. And there must be money in all of this just because of the sheer volume of calls and media. Absolutely. And, it, you know, as I said, they're getting more sophisticated. So yeah. these, you know, if they're purporting to be from your bank, so mm. these spoof numbers, which I was mentioning before, it's very difficult to block them using this technology, because if you block them, you, then you'll be blocking the legitimate number from your bank. I see. Yeah. Um, I might show you the number that's rang me three times today. And then when I ring it back, they say, we can't take your call. We'll come back to you. And they say there's some media company with oh. lots, lots of threes in it. Okay. Who are they? I don't, I'll find Who out. Who are they? <laughs> um, Amelia, um, and did you in, launch this investigation? Was this because of the sheer volume of letters we're getting and money mail from our readers? Some of the cases that we've dealt with have started with with a phone call, and the results end up, you know, frightening because, as you know, as I said before, these these fraudsters. It's more so the fraudsters purporting to be from yes. HMRC and your bank. They're the yeah. ones that are getting through. Um, but you know, there's also the, the the unscrupulous sort of salespeople who are trying to flog you stuff as well. Amelia Murray, she's the chief money mail reporter. Well, that's all we have time for today. For the latest from the Daily Mail news, we come back every day for briefings at 7 a.m., 12 noon, and of course 5 p.m., where you can listen to me all over again. That's all from me, Andrew Pierce, from The Daily Show. I'll be back tomorrow. Have yourselves a great evening and good night. Mm-hmm.